Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast where we explore how discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 186. If you're curious about how your brain really works, this is the podcast for you. Today's episode features Mark Humphreys, author of The Spike, an epic journey through the brain in 2.1 seconds. The spike is another name for an action potential, which is the electrical signal generated by neurons. The great thing about this book is that you can enjoy it no matter how much or how little you already know. So this is an episode for listeners of all backgrounds. Before we jump into today's discussion, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Brain Science is produced independently and relies on the financial support of listeners like you. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. And please send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free Brain Science newsletter. All you have to do is text Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. Before I play the interview, I want to share an excerpt from the book. One thing that really impressed me about this book was the clear, concise description. Humphreys gives of how an action potential is generated. One key idea is that the spike or action potential is all or nothing. Each spike looks the same, and the neuron only fires when a certain threshold is reached. In the book, he describes the neurons as sitting in salty water, which contains lots of sodium and lots of chlorine, while inside the neuron, there's only a little sodium, a little chlorine, and lots of potassium. Sodium is positive, chlorine is negative, and potassium is positive. This sets up a voltage where the inside of the neuron is normally negative compared to the outside. Here's how he describes the process of an action potential on page 13. When the neuron's voltage increases beyond its tipping point, Suddenly, holes that only permit sodium open up in the neuron skin, and sodium ions rush in, rapidly increasing their concentration on the inside and voltage rockets. But only briefly, for the onrush of sodium triggers the opening of a different set of holes in the skin, which pump potassium back to the outside, sending positive charge back out almost as quickly as it's arriving via the sodium ions. In turn, this outrush of potassium shuts off the sodium holes. Ions stop flowing, and just as quickly as it rose, the voltage becomes negative again. This rapid leap and crash of voltage is the spike. With that teaser from the book, let's jump into the interview. I'll be back after the interview to review a few key ideas. Mark Humphreys, welcome to Brain Science. Thank you very much for having me on. Mark, would you start out by just telling my listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in the brain and neuroscience? Sure. So I'm a coder at heart. So I've been programming computers since I was, ooh, I don't know, seven, eight, learning how to program basic on all the on the ancient Commodores and, uh, and other machines. So I was also always interested in computers and coding. And my route into neuroscience was really at university level. I was trying to figure out what to do at university. Originally, I was going to go into chemical engineering, but it turned out I didn't like chemistry when I took it at A level, the higher level exam at, uh, in Britain. So I was flicking through the catalog, trying to find something else that was interesting and came across this degree called cognitive science, which was a mix of coding and computer science, philosophy, AI, stats, and logic, and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And that sounded fascinating. So I signed up for that. And it was through that then I got, a, got immersed in the world of neuroscience. So it's really just my wanting to do something involving code that drew me into it. And then, of course, it turned out that there was a whole area of neuroscience called computational neuroscience, which is about how does the brain compute and code things. And that was what drew me in. 
great. And so it's just natural that you should write a book about action potentials since they are in some way the primary code of the brain. Mark, I want to focus on three key ideas from your book, how the spike or action potential is generated, the idea of dark neurons, and the importance of spontaneous activity. But first, would you like to just give a brief overview of your book and who's the intended audience for this book? The book is really about three journeys. So the most the outline of the book is that it's a, you're following a spike on a journey through the brain. You're following it from the first moments that a photon hit the back of the eyeball, hit the retina, generates spikes that then pass into the rest of the brain for processing. We follow the spike through the early visual areas, through the complicated areas higher up that do object recognition. We follow them up to spikes up to the bits of it's at the front of the brain, the middle of the brain, well, middle of the cortex, the working out what's around you and remembering what's going on and making decisions and working out where things are in space, you can reach for them, and on to the areas of cortex and the rest of the brain that deal with reaching, in this case, seeing a cookie in the box, deciding whether you want to eat it or not, deciding you do, and reaching for it. So this journey for the brain, this journey with the spike was what I wanted to, how to present that a journey through the most recent sort of two to three decades of the advances in systems neuroscience. Systems neuroscience being the bit of neuroscience where we record from more than one neuron at once. The idea of thinking about the brain as a system. And I wanted to do that because there is uh, really very, very little out there for, the, for a general audience on that area of neuroscience, even though it's kind of one of the hottest areas of neuroscience at the moment with great breakthroughs in various areas of the brain published almost weekly now. You get to see very little of it in the popular press, uh, in, in normal sort of media stories, or indeed in, in popular science books. And partly it's because it requires, I guess, quite a sort of a, a level of background, just knowledge of how neurons work to appreciate the work that's being done. So one of the jobs I wanted the book to do was to give everyone that background knowledge so they can then put into context all these really exciting findings from, from neuroscience. So in that respect, then, yeah, the audience is, I aimed for a, ambitiously aimed for a very broad audience. So certainly I wanted it to be accessible to any interested member of the the general public who is an interested science reader. They can pick the book up and learn as they go through from the most basics of how spikes are generated up to some of the most complicated and advanced ideas in neuroscience. But also it was a a way of getting these ideas to uh, audiences who would probably love to know them but won't have the chance to get to grips with them. So people who work in AI, all kinds, who might be interested in what the brain can tell them about new ideas. People who work in clinical fields who may not have the time, of course, to grapple with the complex literature on large-scale neural recordings that appear in in specialist journals. And other areas besides, whatever scientist is interested in neuroscience at this level. So ambitiously, I tried to make the book work as multiple journeys for multiple audiences at the same time. Hopefully, pulled it off. I think you did. So one thing that really impressed me about your book was your clear, concise description of how a action potential or spike is generated. Would you just take us through that very briefly? So an action potential is a brief, all-or-nothing event that a a neuron uses to communicate to other neurons. So each neuron has a voltage. It has a difference in the charge it has on the inside and the outside. And that voltage is constantly flickering up and down as inputs arrive at that neuron. And at some point, that voltage will reach a certain, go up to a certain value, at which it will suddenly leap enormously up and then down again very rapidly. And that enormous up and down a surge of voltage is the action potential. And because it happens really, really rapidly, rapidly goes up, rapidly goes down, it looks like a spiky thing. So hence its informal name in neuroscience is the spike. And it's that leap of voltage up and down that happens at the neuron's body that gets swept down its axon to then turn into the inputs to other neurons at the other end. But at the other end, importantly, it's not the action potential, the spike itself that gets transmitted. It gets sent to the end of the axon. And where on that axon it meets another neuron, the dendrites of another neuron, what the action potential does is it causes the release of transmitter, some kind of chemical that diffuses across to the neuron on the other side, locks into the receptors for that chemical, and causes, in turn, a little brief flicker of that target neuron's voltage, wherever that flicker be up or down. So what that means is that it requires many, many action potentials 
spikes to turn up at a given neuron to create enough flickers of voltage for the voltage to go up to create a new spike. So each action potential, each spike coming out of a neuron is the result of tens or hundreds of spikes arriving at it in roughly the same time. Spikes seem to be unique to the nervous system, correct? So what makes them so special? So there's two things that make this spikes special. One is that they are, as I said, this all or non event. So for any given neuron, the shape of its action potential is the same every time it produces it. So it lasts about a millisecond or two, and it's this rapid leap and fall of voltage. So the signal being sent by that neuron is a binary code. It's whether the potential happens or not. It's not about the size or shape of it. So that's fairly unique. There are other cells in the body that, that use electricity to communicate, for example, to cardiac pacemaker cells in the heart. But those are linked entirely by electricity. Whereas what's happening in the in brain is not only this all or none event, but it's this fact that the, trans, the action potential goes down the axon and it's not used directly, but it's turned from this binary signal back into this more continuous signal where it releases this trans, chemical transmitter to cause some continuous change in voltage on the other side. And so it's that's both that binary nature that makes it so fascinating to people who like may have come from a coding background because clearly anything that's binary is, is a really interesting way of grappling with that. It's a coding problem. And the fact that then the brain turns this binary code back into something more continuous is also a really interesting facet of how the brain works, which is unique to it. And it's a very powerful way of, of having control over the messages being passed between neurons. What else would you like to share about spikes? It's a very long list of things I could share about spikes. I guess one of the, the key sort of bits of knowledge to understand how spikes work is, that is what happens when they get to the end of that, that axon and they release the transmitter. So the spike, it, spike sent by the neuron itself tells us nothing about the direction of the message that's going to be sent. So we know it doesn't tell us anything about whether that neuron is sending a, a message of uh, that's going to excite the neuron at the other end or inhibit it. The only way we know that is from the type of chemical that's released by the neuron onto its target. So it releases a type of chemical called glutamate, for example, then we know that that spike is going to cause an upward flipper in voltage. It releases a chemical called GABA instead, and we know that neuron's going to cause a downward flicker in voltage in the target neuron. And generally, most neurons in the brain have only one type of this chemical, these transmitters, that they transmit with. So the, the message received by a given neuron is then a mix of these spikes arriving, which cause flickers of voltage up, flickers of voltage down. The flickers of voltage up driving it towards making a new spike, the flickers of voltage down stopping a new spike. And so it's this interplay between the two that's really crucial for the generation of a new spike. This has a whole name called the balance theory of how spikes are generated, that the idea is that at any given neuron, particularly in cortex, there's a fairly good balance between the amount a neuron is excited and the amount it's inhibited which means that on average, its voltage is constantly flicking around on some low average, and only occasionally by chance does enough excitatory input turn up to create a new spike. What that means then is that the spikes coming out of any given neuron look like they're happening at a random time because they are it's almost a random process when that input, so excitatory input, exceeds that inhibitory input. So they look as though they're just transmitted randomly, but actually each spike is caused by a barrage of spikes arriving at, at the same time to that neuron. So in the brain, there's this lovely paradox of, we know that spikes, each spike has a definite cause, but if you look at the output of just a single neuron, it looks random. So what about dendrites? Talk a little bit about the difference between the axon and what happens at the dendrites. Okay, so the dendrites of a neuron are where that neuron is gathering all its input from the other neurons. So typically on a dendrite, in cortex, there'll be up to around 10,000 inputs from other cortical neurons. And that dendrite can be very large compared to the neuron's body itself. So there will be inputs falling all over it, some inputs falling far away from the neuron's body, some close to. And the dendrites are very branched. So there are many routes for signals that arrive at each input of the dendrite to take down to the body. And the ordering of inputs on the dendrites will also make a big difference. So if there are inputs right to the, out, to the tips of the dendrites that are coming from neurons that ex, are excitatory, so cause a little upward blip of voltage, that little upward blip has got to travel all the way down to the body. 
And on the way there, down, it can be either enhanced by other excitatory input or it can be squashed by inhibitory input coming in on its path closest to the body of the neuron. So the dendrite itself has the capability of doing sort of fairly complicated computational things of which the neuron's body, the place where it generates the spike, is completely oblivious. So in fact, there are quite beautiful theories about how the dendrite of a pyramidal neuron in cortex, a sort of classical cortical neuron, which has this very long, straight up dendrite within branches a lot at the top. There are theories about how that, each branch of that dendrite is fairly independent, as in it sums up all of its inputs irrespective of what's happening in other branches, and then sends its summed up input down to the neuron's body. And if each of them are doing that, then it's as though the branches of the dendrite are acting as one layer of a neural network and are sending all their outputs to the neuron's body, which is the second layer of the neural network. So in this scheme, the dendrite itself is capable of quite advanced computation. By comparison, the axon we think of really as a sort of as a transmission cable. It's really its job is just to take the spike that generated by the neuron's body and send it out to where it needs to go to. And internally, it has no complex computation capability. It's really just there as a way of getting spike from A to B. I want to take a moment to mention our longtime sponsor, Text Expander. Text Expander allows you to use snippets to avoid repetitive typing. I use it for everything from short signatures to full length emails. Best of all, you can use any platform, Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPad, or iPhone, and share your snippets across your devices or with team members. Brain Science listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast for 20% off your first year. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on Brain Science. So what are dark neurons and how were they discovered? So the dark neurons, as I describe them in the book, are these neurons which we know to exist, but we don't really see them being active. They were hidden from view for a very long time. So traditionally, when neuroscientists have recorded neurons, what they've done is they've taken a metal electrode, really fine, sharp electrode, and had to lower it into the brain of an animal, into the area of the brain they want to record from, so into the layers of cortex or deeper into hippocampus or wherever. That electrode would be attached to an amplifier, an amplifier attached to either the speakers in the lab or attached to an oscilloscope to look at the signal coming from the electrode or the speaker so you can hear the blip of the voltage on the electrode. So the only way you knew where you, you were recording a neuron was because as you lowered the electrode, the speakers in the lab would suddenly start blipping away or the oscilloscope would start showing the big jagged voltage signal coming off the electrode. Now perversely, what that means is that the only way you, you can record neurons is if neurons are active. So every time you lower an electrode into the brain like that, it looks like every neuron is active. So it gives the impression that the brain is, all the neurons in the brain are constantly sending spikes. However, when you then take advantage of our modern methods for recording neurons, so particularly imaging them, so when we can, instead of recording with electrodes, we record with essentially a video camera. And what we're recording is either dyes or, or genetically expressed proteins that are inside each neuron. And those dyes or proteins, they fluoresce. So they reflect back more photons the more active the neuron is. So when you image that part of the brain with those chemicals fluorescing away, you can see which neurons are active and which ones aren't. And when you do that, you actually see that most neurons that you're looking at in this little section of the brain are not fluorescing at all. Most of them are almost completely silent. And about the same time as, as this method became widely available, similarly, other people use this very fiddly technique called patch clamping, which is where instead of lowering electrode into the brain and just recording some neuron that was nearby to the electrode, you try and get your electrode to attach directly to a neuron, which is extremely difficult because the body of a neuron is sort of, I think, a factor of 10 smaller than the width of the human hair. So you attach it to the, this electrode to the body of the neuron, and that way you definitely are holding a neuron. You definitely know you're on that neuron. And then you can record whether or not it's doing anything at all. 
And the few cases where people have success, successfully done that in animals that were awake and doing stuff, they find that most neurons that they attached to indeed were not sending any spikes at all for most of the time they were looking at them. So these, these dark neurons are these, this big mass of neurons in the brain that we can see in these animals when they're doing these tasks, things like running through a maze or listening to sounds. Uh, for most of the periods of the time they've been recorded from, seem to be doing nothing whatsoever. What are these dark neurons doing? So the mystery of what they're doing takes up one of the core questions in the book. So in the book, I offer three different possibilities. But what I'm really flagging in the book is this is an area of research that's really quite untouched at the moment. And partly because it's untouched is because it's, it requires a lot more data. The most obvious of these reasons then for why they appear to be dark is because we aren't in the lab. We're not giving the brain anything interesting enough to do. So I give the example there of a rat running through a maze or mouse running through a maze as a case where we know there's a lot of neurons in bit of its cortex where they're not active while it's running in the maze. And these mazes are really simple. They're not very exciting things to look at. The random has to do this, this running through the maze over and over and over again. It's not being asked to do anything complicated or forage for food or do anything that's more natural. So quite possible that the reason we see dark neurons everywhere is because the things that we ask animals to do are really quite boring. And those neurons just aren't involved in the very few things that we ask them to do. Another classic example of this is Bruno Olshausen long ago asked, what's the other 85% of neurons in V1 doing, the very first area visual cortex? Because even there, we'd expect that most neurons in the visual, the first area visual cortex will not be active most of the time. Because when in the lab, we just never show them any pictures that they're interested in. The animals that are showing these pictures their neurons just aren't responding because they don't have anything in them that those neurons are interested in. Well, the other two ideas are what they're for, I flipped to one is simply that they are a reserve army, that they are there to be recruited when we need to learn or represent new things. And partly that's an argument from the fact that, obviously, as any mammal has a, needs a repertoire of neurons to be able to call upon when it has to learn, represent new skills or new things. But that's a fairly speculative idea. The third idea of what, what they're for is is that actually, although they're dark, although they very rarely send any spikes, they actually make up the bulk of the neurons that we record from. So if I define a neuron as dark as anything that sends less than, say, one spike every second, then it actually that definition gives us about 75% of all neurons in the brain fit that definition. We're thinking of it slightly wrong, that it's not that these neurons individually are not sending many spikes, but collectively, because it's three quarters of the neurons in the brain, Together, they are sending a lot of spikes, just not individually. So perhaps it's more important to look at the message being sent by hundreds of neurons at the same time, rather than just one. What about the so-called type 2 dark neurons? So I coin in the book this term, this, these type 2 dark neurons, which is a thing I've not seen in the literature. So I wanted to, to give it a name and, and draw people's attention to it. So they are the, the flip side. These are... So the dark neurons, as I laid them out originally, were this idea that there's these neurons that send any spikes to things happening in the outside world. Conversely, there seems to hold be a whole bunch of neurons, or the ones that are active that we can see, whose activity, again, doesn't seem to reflect anything about the outside world. You recall neurons from, say, bits of the visual cortex. You play, they're definitely sending spikes. You show the animal lots and lots and lots of pictures, and they don't respond to any of those pictures. They don't show any obvious change in firing that's going on in front of the animal. So they're definitely sending spikes. Something is receiving their output. They seem to be dark with respect to the outside world. They don't change in the outside world seems to be not, not affecting them. So one reason why they might exist in the book is that perhaps they are there as a, a scaffolding for uh, what's happening in the brain. They are there to drive the dynamics of the brain. How does the ability to record from hundreds of neurons simultaneously change our approach to decoding the messages in the brain? It's, uh, the ability to record from hundreds of neurons dramatically changes our approaches to how we understand the messages being sent by neurons. So we've spent many, many years, nearly a century now, recording from lots of individual neurons and looking at how each individual neuron responds to what's happening in the world. So. If it's a neuron in visual cortex, we will 
look at how it responds to a particular picture or a particular angle of a line or a particular color. If it's a neuron in, uh, say, motor cortex, then we'll be looking to how it responds just before some movement happens to, to sort of reach of the arm or a, a movement of the eye, let's say. But that's a, a view of individual neurons. And as we've just sort of rehearsed all the dark neuron stuff, the vast majority of neurons in the brain don't seem to be encoding stuff in that way, in their, in their individual spikes. So instead, it's now become quite uh, routine to, when you've recorded from tens or hundreds of neurons or more, to try and look at what has been encoded by the spike sent by all of those neurons, rather than just one of them. And in particular, look at what's encoded by a lot, many neurons that individually, none of which seem to be responding to the outside world. And when we do that, we inf indeed find actually that the collective message of these neurons is telling us an awful lot about the outside world. So, for example, from some of our own work, we were looking at recordings of tens of neurons in the prefrontal cortex of rats running through a maze. And we were looking at whether from the activity in that, those tens of neurons, we could decode what the animal had just experienced. As it was trudging back along the maze, we were wanting to know whether the animal could remember the choice it had made or whether it had gone left or right when it had to get to the choice point of the maze to remember whether it had got a uh, reward or not when it got to the end of the, the arm it had chosen, reward being chocolate milk, because rats love chocolate milk, and to remember whether or not the light was on at the end of the arm when it got there. On it, so as it's walking its way back, we looked in the activity in the prefrontal cortex, and from these tens of neurons, we asked whether we could use various techniques of machine learning to decode from their spikes these memories. Indeed, we could decode all of them. We could decode the fact that it remembered where it got left or right, it had remembered whether it had got reward or not, and we could decode whether it had seen the light or not. And we could do that even though in many of our recordings that we were looking at, there were no individual neurons that seemed to respond to any of these things individually. So rather, it's that across all the neurons, there are enough that occasionally send spikes to one thing but not the other, and not necessarily reliably, that together they do reliably encode something that was happening, in this case, a memory of various things in the world. So it's this population coding approach, we've got population neurons, that is really changing the way we think about how the brain computes and codes. How do we make sure that we're not guilty of the decoding fallacy? Yeah, so the de decoding fallacy is actually tied nicely into the example I just gave. It's it's this reminder to ourselves not to overinterpret what we, we do. So as I just said, from that example in, in the rats and prefrontal cortex, we could decode using machine learning techniques, using these linear classifiers, what the animal had just experienced, whether they had just experienced a reward or not, just experienced going left or right, just experienced whether the light was on or off when it got to the end of the arm it had chosen. So it would be tempting from that to say that okay, we can decode it from these neurons. Therefore, these population of neurons must be encoding the light, the choice direction, the reward. But actually, it doesn't tell us that. All it tells us is that there's something being encoded in the brain that correlates with these properties. It could be something else that co-occurs with these things, of course. So something else that co-occurs in the world with these things. Equally, it could be that, obviously, what's actually encoded in the brain is not specifically near these features. It's that because there has been a change in the state of the world, it is the change in the state of the world that we're reading out. And it's not explicitly a specific neuron that stands specifically for the memory of going left, but the fact that having gone left is different from having gone right. So it's really about there has been a change than there is an explicit encoding of a particular feature. So yeah, so decoding fallacy is essentially is, as I said, this reminder not to be not to confuse ourselves with the fact that we can decode stuff, the fact that it actually exists in the brain. So what about memory? How are dark neurons involved in memory? So this population coding view of the brain, where this, this population is going to be made up of lots of these type 2 and, type, and the original dark neurons that don't respond very much and neurons that are active but don't individually seem to change. Their role in memory is thought to be that they are the, it's the joint activity of, their, of that population is continuing during a period in which memory needs to be sustained. So here we're talking particularly about 
that forms of memory which are really short term. It's the kind of memory where you're holding things in mind, like where you just put your keys or a number that someone's just told to you. It's the kind of thing that you internally mentally rehearse. That kind of memory is thought to be mostly stored up in prefrontal cortex because if you damage or manipulate prefrontal cortex in animals, they can't store that kind of memory, sort of working short term memory. So it's neurons up in prefrontal cortex, they joint activity, which seems to be encoding these memories. So from the activity of tens or hundreds of prefrontal cortex neurons, you can read out the memory of something that an animal just experienced. It's also in, well, we know this partly because in prefrontal cortex, again, it's one of the success cases of recording from individual neurons. And we know there, there are lots of individual neurons where if, say, you ask an animal to remember the frequency of vibration it's just felt on its fingertip, to compare to another one that's coming later, then there are neurons in prefrontal cortex that will fire why it has to remember this, and fire at a rate that is changes according to the frequency of the stimulus that it got on its fingertip. So there, it's encoding a, it's called a parametric working memory. There are neurons whose, whose number spikes they send seem to quantify the memory as well as sustain the memory. With the more, as I say, with more modern approaches, these more, more population coding approaches, we can see that that seems to be true in the prefrontal cortex, even without lots of individual neurons that encode for specific things that we can take these spikes of many, many, many neurons together and still decode what the animal was keeping in mind. Okay, so I want to focus a little bit more on the consequence of decoding these populations of neurons instead of just monitoring an individual neuron. So one of the consequences of decoding from populations of neurons rather than individuals is it really changes the emphasis on where we think the important computations happening in the in the brain so if we record from lots of individual neurons and we look at what individual neurons are telling us about the world then we develop lots of theories and models for how individual neurons can get information from the outside world and then use it to represent things so there are pretty advanced models of how individual neurons in visual cortex and other sensory areas of individual neurons will receive input sensory inputs from the outside world and use those in a way to create their outputs and how those outputs internally used by neurons further on to create their outputs and those are all models and theories based on this idea that individual neurons including specific things but then when we look at populations of neurons we get to the most extreme point of view for that is that there is no such thing as individual neuron encoding. That because we can decode all this information perfectly well from a whole group of neurons that seem to individually have no coding, and because what each neuron actually receives from other neurons is hundreds of spikes across a population, then it seems to make more sense to think about what population of neurons are encoding rather than individual neurons. And to consider the possibility that because the brains of mammals in particular are, are so huge, you know, even the cortex of a mouse has got 10 million neurons in it, and our cortex has got 17 billion neurons in it, that if we record from, happen to record from a, a tiny sample of active neurons in those brains, then we will happen to find some that appear to be tuned to individual properties of the world. But that's just, that's probably just this view chance. Uh, the actual thing that's doing the work is whole populations of neurons sending spikes together. Is population coding more accurate? Yes. So typically population co decoding is more accurate. You get quite a few people have done analyses where you, you essentially, you record a lot of neurons together and you start by decoding from just a few of them and you keep adding more and more neurons from your recording population and seeing how much better your decoding gets. And typically, as you get past a handful of neurons, your decoding gets better and better and better. You are more able, more accurately able to decode what's happening in the world, whether that would be the, something about the stimulus the animal was receiving or whether about the movement it's about to do. But then it plateaus at a certain point. Obviously, one of the reasons it, might, it plateaus is, is because there also seems to be quite a lot of redundancy in a given population of neurons, both in terms of the fact that in, lots of individual neurons will be responding to similar things, and the fact that lots of individual neurons seem to be a little bit correlated in when they send their spikes. There seems to be an upper limit to how big a population can be and still and send useful information. So while it is more accurate than individual neuron encoding, 
there is a, a sort of big open question about how big a population needs to be in order to accurately encode stuff, and at which point it just becomes useless adding more and more neurons to it. Last month, I introduced a new sponsor, NordVPN, which is a highly rated virtual private network service. NordVPN protects your internet connection and privacy online while providing the fastest VPN out there based on speed tests. You can use six devices on every major platform. It allows you to pick a server in any country so that you can get content you might not otherwise be able to access. This is great for gaming and video streaming. The main reason I use NordVPN is so that I can use public Wi-Fi safely and securely. This is really important when I travel. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash brain science or use the code brain science to get your two-year plan plus a bonus gift with a huge discount. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee if it's not for you. That's nordvpn.com forward slash brain science. So spontaneous activity is something that's been an a ongoing theme on this podcast, including last year when Yuri Bushaki and George Norkoff were on the show. But I'd like for you to share your thoughts. Sure. So spontaneous activity is at least in my book, spontaneous activity is the stuff, the activity in the brain that is not caused by any external influence. And it took a while to appreciate that this was even something that happened. So again, the view of the brain where you lower electrodes into the brain and you record from individual neurons, because you're recording neurons are always active and you're looking for ones that are responding to the things you're showing the animal or making the animal do, like move around, it comes difficult to appreciate that Actually, many of the neurons in the brain are, are sending spikes all the time, regardless of what's happening in the outside world. And actually, there are obviously some pretty obvious cases where that's going to be happening. So most obviously in sleep, sleep when we're asleep, one would you know, knows that we're not looking at anything. So our, presumably our visual cortex isn't having to process anything right now. Nonetheless, your neurons throughout your visual cortex and beyond are sending spikes merrily away just as though you were looking at stuff. Similarly, in your, in your developing brain in the womb, your neurons are, are developing into things that start sending spikes. This starts in the retina, we're sending lots of things called retinal waves, with waves of activity go across the retina, and spikes are firing all over the brain before, even before the air region of the brain has to be doing anything in particular. The way that this, this spontaneous activity is, is created comes in two parts. So one path is that there is created by the feedback between neurons in the brain. And the other is that there are actually neurons in the brain that generate their own activity. So why is this spontaneous activity so important? We really want to know what it what it's for. Just like the problem with the individual neurons responding to the outside world, most of our models of how the brain works are based on Neurons sending spikes because they're encoding something, either they're encoding something happening in the outside world to them, so some pictures, some sounds, some, some you know, smells, or they're encoding something that's about to happen. So they're encoding some movements, some movements of the arm, leg, eye, head, whatever. But with so many, so many neurons sending spontaneous spikes, we don't really have a good, strong theories of, of what those are for. And particularly in cortex, it seems that those spontaneous spikes are, are generated by the circuit itself, by the feedback between the neurons. And what it suggests, of course, is that the spontaneous activity must be doing something important. So in the book, I give essentially two general answers to that question. So one reason for having spontaneous activity is to solve a problem of the fact that individual neurons are quite sluggish in their response. So as I said at the top of the the podcast, how neurons send their spikes because they have to get tens or hundreds of inputs from other neurons to enough to drive their voltage up to create a spike. And that process can take quite a long time. So if we need to get some information from the outside world, from the eye all the way to the prefrontal cortex in a matter of tens of milliseconds in order for us to react to it properly and make some decisions about it, then we can't rely on neurons going from their sort of resting state all the way up to creating a spike 
in the something like seven to nine different regions of the brain that those spikes would have to jump through because that might take seconds, if not a couple of minutes. And we've only got tens of milliseconds in which to, to process this stuff. So one good reason for having spontaneous activity might simply be because that forces the neurons are under this, neurons under this constant barrage of input. So what that does, it forces the neurons to always be close to the point where they're able to send a spike if they need to. It's simple then to show that kind of idea that you can then transmit spikes very rapidly through the brain because every time a, um, say a stimulus is shown to your eyeball, there will be neurons ready to respond at the back of the eyeball almost instantly and then send spikes to the first area of visual cortex. That first area of visual cortex, there'll be a whole bunch of neurons that are just about ready to send their spikes. That input arrives, they send the spikes immediately into the next area of cortex the same, the next area of cortex the same, the next area of cortex. So each wave of output instantly triggers a response and you have this whole barrage of information being passed through the brain in a matter of tens of milliseconds as opposed to seconds or minutes. Now it's a terrific theory, but it also has a slight downside in it is that it's really quite prosaic in the role it's positing for spontaneous activity. Because after all this, generating all these millions and probably billions of spontaneous spikes every second is extremely energy intensive. And to do that just in case you need to respond to quick something quickly seems to be an extraordinary use of energy. The other main idea I explore in the book about why they exist is because they actually are doing some kind of computation themselves. All that computation is some kind of prediction. So we have very well rehearsed high level theories about the predictive brain, about predictive processing, stuff that, that sort of Andy Clark write books about and, and lots of people write theories about how brains may, in theory, do predictive processing. There is very much less, though, on how brains actually do predictive processing. So my solution to how they actually do it is that the spontaneous activity the brain generates anyway has been co-opted to do this predictive processing. What else would you like to share before we close? So the spontaneous activity part in particular, the idea that it does predictive processing is this idea that most of the things that we see that the brain does, things about things where uh, we seem to, res- seem to be able to s- uh, respond to change in our, our visual world very quickly about how we can um, remember things well, about how we, how we make decisions quickly. These are all due to the fact that spontaneous activity is, is there in the brain, creating the conditions in which they are predicting what each of those things is going to be in advance of them being used. And partly that's just taking advantage of the fact that our brains are, are huge. So we can give over all this huge amount of resources to this predictive stuff, even if the prediction never comes true. Because the other thing I'd like to, to just touch on from the book briefly is sort of my, my personal favorite bit of the book is a whole chapter where I talk about this paradoxical thing where spikes sent by neurons you would think would be this this highly reliable transmission system that you using all this energy to create this spike that goes sent down the axon to be given as a message to another neuron. And yet we know that it's in the cortex, most of the spikes sent by neurons will not reach most of their intended targets. So if a neuron contacts, say, 10,000 other neurons, then a given spike it sends will only reach something like 100 to 500 of those neurons. So the vast majority of them will never even see that spike. That's because of each individual connection, each individual synapse between that neuron who sends that spike and all of its targets, the spike when it arrives will fail to release any transmitter. And this failure seems really at odds with how we think brains work. But as outlined in the book, actually this failure may paradoxically be, be a deliberate design feature to solve all sorts of intriguing problems that the brains have to solve. So for example, how it solves the problem of searching for solutions to problems. Because we know that in, in our computer science algorithms where we search for problems, every computer science algorithm we use for searching for things has some kind of noise in it deliberately built in to make sure that algorithm explores the space of possible solutions. So one idea is that what the, this deliberate failure is doing in the brain is deliberately inducing noise in order to create a way for the brain to explore solutions. Yeah, there was just so much material in the book. There was no way that we could cover everything. My traditional closing question is, what is your advice for students? Well, I guess as this is a, is a broadly aimed book, I give fairly advice fairly broadly for different uh, types of students. 
so for any students who are really interested in getting into, into this area of neuroscience, the systems area of neuroscience, it is unavoidably a little bit computation heavy because of dealing with the data themselves, it's computationally heavy, even before we analyze the data, just getting the data out and making sense of them. If you're recording hundreds of neurons at the same time with electrodes, you need to, to have lots of computational algorithms to sort out the spikes from each of those individual neurons. If you're imaging hundreds of neurons, you need lots and lots of computation to turn those raw fluorescence signals into meaningful things that the neurons are doing. And then the analysis of all that data is inevitably strongly computational. I would say for any students really keen on this particular field of neuroscience, there's two key things. So one is some knowledge of coding in whatever that language is, whether that be Python or MATLAB or Julia or some other kind of very powerful general scripting language. And the other piece of advice is what I would have given myself uh, had I gone back 20 odd years is learn some linear algebra. Because as quixotic as linear algebra is to many people who learn it, it turns out it's brutally useful when you're doing anything that involves lots and lots of neurons because there are matrices and vectors everywhere. And being even vaguely conversant in it is extremely useful. I want to thank Mark Humphreys for coming on Brain Science to tell us about his new book, The Spike, An Epic Journey Through the Brain in 2.1 Seconds. This book is a wonderfully clear description of our knowledge of how action potentials are generated, along with a few of the surprising discoveries that have resulted from the new techniques that make it possible not only to record from hundreds of neurons spontaneously, but also to appreciate that neurons are doing computations even when they don't generate spikes or action potential. This is a book that can be enjoyed by listeners of all backgrounds. I found the discovery of the so-called dark neurons especially fascinating. There is no exact definition of a dark neuron, but think of these as the neurons that are firing less than once a minute. I also want to emphasize how discovering these neurons required new techniques that allow researchers to detect and observe neurons that aren't firing. Then there is something of an overlap between the idea of spontaneous activity and what Humphreys calls type 2 dark neurons, since these are neurons that are not firing in response to any obvious external inputs. One of the key techniques that we discussed was the ability to record from increasingly large numbers of neurons simultaneously. This not only allows us to appreciate the role of dark neurons and the fact that much of what the brain does is spontaneous, that is not generated by inputs from the outside world, but it also led to the key discovery that decoding should probably be based on populations of neurons rather than at the level of a single neuron. I should mention that that idea is also driving current successful attempts to create brain-machine interfaces that allow patients to control things like artificial limbs. Finally, we explored Humphrey's take on the possible role of the brain's spontaneous activity. This is a topic we discussed last year in episode 172 and 174. Obviously, this is an area of active interest, but Humphrey suggests a couple of possibilities. One is that this spontaneous activity keeps neurons near threshold so that they will fire more quickly when an external signal appears. Another possibility is that the neurons are doing some sort of computation that is of importance to the predictive abilities of the brain. And he actually said that maybe this spontaneous activity is how the brain does its prediction. The Spike, an epic journey through the brain in 2.1 seconds by Mark Humphreys is a great book for listeners of all backgrounds. I'd love to hear what you think about today's episode. You can write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or post to the Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. Please visit brainsciencepodcast.com for complete show notes and episode transcripts. And I hope you'll sign up for the free newsletter. You can do this on the website or by texting brain science, all one word, to 55444. If you haven't already got my book, Are You Sure the Unconscious Origins of Certainty? 
don't forget you can email me if you'd like to get a autographed copy. And as always, I appreciate your support. If you would like to know how to support the show, go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Last but not least, I will remind you that I'm looking for volunteers to help with the redesign of the Brain Science Podcast website. Just email me if you want to help out. Thanks again for listening. I hope to be back with you soon. And until then, I hope you'll check out my other podcasts, books and ideas, and graying rainbows. Brain Science is copyright 2021 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mind Fire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.